Welcome back to Ask GC Anything, uh, which is in fact the last one for the foreseeable future because for the next few months we've got a different type of content coming up for you on GCN each and every Friday. Uh, don't despair though if you've yet to have your training related question answered by us because we'll still be doing one question each week over on the GCN show. Uh, so make sure you still get them in on social media using the hashtag Ask GCN Training because you might also win yourself three months free subscription to Zwift. Now last week I teased you all with a question on half wheeling but for whatever reason it never made it into the final episode. So this week though, with a little help from my models, these models, I'm gonna answer your question. Yeah, and we're gonna tell you how to deal with a dreaded half wheeler as well, aren't we? Uh, we're also going to be looking into how to stay fit when you don't have access to your bike, how off-road cycling benefits your road cycling, how to prevent speed waddle, and also how to repair holes in your Lycra. Uh, first up though, it is the half wheeling question, and it came in from Adam Watson. Hi Chris, really enjoyed the video. My question is this, I've heard the, heard the term half wheelie on GCN, what is it and why is it bad form? Right then Dan, rider B. Grab your model. I'll be rider A. So rider A starts off by riding alongside rider B, but then, imaginatively, puts the half wheel on. This refers to the fact that the front wheel is now half a wheel ahead of his partner's front wheel, so the hub is now level with the tip of the front rim on his partner. Rider B then responds to this input in speed. Rider A then counteracts this by once again putting his wheel half ahead. Rider B responds, and so on. You can see how this is going to escalate. Yeah. And it is absolutely infuriating, isn't it? If you're on the receiving end of it. Infuriating, frustrating, all of the above. Because ine inevitably, what it means is that the speed you're riding at consistently ramps up to the point where it's not only uncomfortable for you two on the front, it's also uncomfortable for everybody trying to sit in your wheel as well. And the thing is, I don't think most half wheelers even realize that they're doing it. No. Because if you actually say to them, can you stop half wheeling me? In general, they apologize and they stop half wheeling and ride level with you for about 60 seconds until inevitably normal service yeah. resumes. You know what? I think a lot of it actually comes from trying to have a conversation with someone. Like you normally try and look into someone's face. So you go forward so you can look back into their face from experience. Anyway, there are a few things you can do. First off, sensible discussion about actually, come on buddy, like please stop doing this to me, this is just not enjoyable. Other than that though, there are a few other tricks. You could put two, um, you know, I don't know what you call them, two half wheelers on the front together, yeah. and then you can sit on, that's quite enjoyable generally, yeah, you get a nice toe. If there's you? another half wheel in a group, put them both on the front together and hope that you can slipstream behind them. Or if you're strong enough, you can counteract the half wheel each time. If you, Certainly if you know you're stronger than they are, and just keep on doing this until they completely blow and crack. Yeah. That's the best way. Well, that do. is the best way if you're strong enough to do that. Uh, or the other thing is you can just gently pull them back on yeah. that shoulder just to remind them that once again, they're half a wheel in front of you. But as we said before, incredibly infuriating, yeah. the old half wheeler. You know, on a club ride, they used to say, you got a long bike, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> what? What do you mean? So, the winner of three months free subscription to Zwift this week is Scott Vesey. He writes in with, during higher cadence training rides, my heart rate is higher and my power output is lower than usual. What can I do to maintain a typical power output during higher cadence work? Well, it might well be that you are never able to put out the same amount of power at an extremely high cadence as you can at your self-selected cadence. Because mechanically speaking, really high cadences are not very efficient at all. You can have a much higher energy expenditure at 130 RPM versus 80. Uh, what you should think about with this as an extreme example is trying to ride at 200 RPM. If you're gifted, you might be able to do it for 30 seconds or so, but you're never going to be able to maintain it that long because it's so inefficient. But on the flip side, you'll often, often see pros spinning at around 100 RPM or more for a couple of reasons. Number one, it reduces muscle fatigue, so you're not putting the same strain on the muscle as if you were pedaling at 60 RPM, for example, by using a lighter load. But also, you can respond better to attacks and accelerations in the group. Mm. In and see, pro riders are in general, of course, more powerful uh, than your average man or woman, and higher cadences become more efficient when you're putting out more power, hence why track sprinters, despite their huge legs, are spinning around the track at about 130 RPM. So Scott, what I would say is that if you want to try and get more efficient at riding at a higher RPM, you're just gonna to have to do more training of it. Yeah, so ideally you do this by doing a few shorter efforts in any given ride that you do. You want to aim to break this down into intervals, so you want to do 120 to 140 RPM for around eight to, eight to 10 intervals in any given session, and you want to do these for around 60 seconds in duration each time. But the important thing is to remain really smooth and stable in your saddle, so you don't want to be bouncing around just because your legs are getting around really quickly. You may need to ever so slightly lower your saddle height because, well, perhaps it was too high in the first place, because you should always be able to pedal smoothly without 
that bouncing. Yeah, that sort of session is definitely one that's fairly easy to do, or even easier than out on the road if you try and do it on an indoor trainer, whether that's a static one or perhaps some rollers. There's an old school method that you could try to use as well, and that is using a fixed gear bike. Now you might be fortunate enough to have a local velodrome where you can go to training sessions or even do some races, but even if you don't, you can relatively cheaply set yourself up a fixed gear bike with brakes so that you can go out on the road, and that's going to get you used to and efficient at a whole range of different cadences from about 40 RPM on the steepest climbs to up to 150 as you go down the other side. Yeah, brutal. Practice makes perfect, just like anything though. And if you would like a few more tips, Dan, Oscar from GCN Espanol and Hank actually did a video on it last year. But when you're riding on the road, it's a lot easier to sit at 80 RPM than it is, say, to sit at 60. And that is because you don't have to put as much force down on the pedals to ride at a specific power. Seeing as it's the last Ask GT thing for some time, should we try and do a quick, quick fire round? We could try. That's what's coming up for you now. First up, this from Chris Walters. Uh, I really enjoyed Chris's show on training based on your lactate threshold heart rate, but I'm not clear on how to use this data as I train. For instance, on high intensity interval training, what should I be aiming for? Also, I'm doing a century ride in six weeks. What should I aim for so that I don't burn myself out before the end? Any suggestions? Greatly appreciated. Well, well, first off, when it comes to those high intensity intervals, anything under three minutes, basically, you can forget aiming for a heart rate target because it's just too, too short a window for your heart rate to respond to it. So you, it's a full commitment to a max effort. And then when it comes to your century ride, I would aim to stay well below your lactate threshold heart rate for the majority of the ride. This will ensure you get to the end of the ride in good condition. If you're looking for an average to aim for, average heart rate, so around 90% of your LTHR, which would be, you know, like a zone three kind of heart rate average. Right, that was reasonably long. Cracking on, Ricardo Ferraro. I was descending the Paso Stelvio when very strong winds forced me and other cyclists to dismount and hold strong our bikes and not let them and us fall off the mountain. It was insane. How do you deal with such a situation? Well, in terms of your stance, strong yeah, strong grip. You want to make change you're strong on the bike, probably on the drops as well. Yeah, I would. The biggest thing with um, crosswinds. Get, get low. Yeah, get low too. The biggest thing across with though is always the equipment and particularly the front wheel depth because if that is deep, it really is going to throw you off balance. So if it is windy outside and you have access to almost box section rims, that's going to make a very big difference. Yeah. But at a certain point, it does become so windy that we recommend not going out in the first place. How windy that is, we don't really know, but you need to assess wind speed and how open the roads are that you ride on. Yeah, and your own confidence and ability. Hmm. Right, uh, next one comes in from... Kateri Zam. Yeah, thank you for your magnificent and informative videos. Thank you for your compliment. Uh, it's how hot in Antalya, Turkey. Therefore, in summer, I have time to train from 5.30am to 7.30. I'm limited to six hours a week. 36-year-old female. Does short intervals and sprint session training do any harm for a sleepy body? And how does one train in the mornings? Thank you. It's a good question. And now, statistically, peak human performance is actually reached in the evening. I remember reading this a few years ago as part of a study that was conducted. Suggest so stay up all night so it feels like the evening. Yeah, you could do, but <laughs> it's probably not to be recommended though, Sorry, is it? I'm ruining the quick fire round again. My point was though, whilst peak performances are set in the evening, there is no reason not to do these maximal efforts in the morning, as long as you ensure that you do give your chance, yourself a chance to have a good warm up. So a good eight to 12 minutes warming up. And if it's warm where you're living, which you say it is, that'll go that little bit quicker. Yeah, I did a 20 minute run this morning at 6.15. And I was terrible. Dan, I did a two hour bike ride at five o'clock yesterday morning, so. Blimey, always gotta go one better, doesn't he? Right, on to Jos McKenney. I've got a Castelli Gile jersey and bib shorts, which are less than a month old. But after a crash, I've got new holes in them. Is there any way to repair ripped cycling clothing or are they a lost cause? Do you know what? My mum actually used to repair my Lycra when I was a youngster because I couldn't afford to buy new shorts or a jersey if I came up in a crash, which ha happened with alarming regu <laughs> regularity, should I say. And what she'd do is she'd get another piece of Lycra, put it on the inside and sew it up. So it was reasonably neat. Could have been a lot neater had I not crashed in the first place. Do you know what? She also used to sew up the end of my Lycra shorts so that they were actually tight on my skinny little legs. Wow. Do your mum ever have to do that for you? No, I generally my kit would have to be taken out a little bit <laughs> to fit. Thankfully these days, uh, they almost fit me. There's a couple of things in my mind right now, Dan. I'm impressed that you went for a run yesterday morning. And also the first story I ever heard about you was you crashing. Yeah, and probably the last as well. Do have a tendency to crash quite a lot. All right, here's one for you, Chris, uh, from Alice Langston. Regarding the question answered by Zwift coaches, if you're doing a high intensity interval training workout with full gas sprints, how long should each sprint be? As long as you can go or more structured than that? 
Uh, well, Alice, the target time for any hit high intensity interval training sprint is generally 30 seconds. This is because if you go any longer and you'll lose the intensity that you're trying to work aim for. And if you go shorter, then the sprint won't be long enough to stimulate your VO2 um, energy systems, which is what you're trying to increase with these hit intervals. Uh, right, finally, this one from Aaron Brewer. Do the organizers of a major stage race generally sweep the course beforehand to clear any sand, etc., such as on a descent or around fast corners? Simple answer is yes. If there's any loose stuff on the surface, they will go around and make sure it's swept off before the race comes through. Even for a race such as Paris-Roubaix, believe it or not, which yep. is over the rough stuff and the cobbles, uh, if there's too much sand, etc., they will start to clean it on the run up to the race. I guess the, uh, the one race where they won't do that is Strada Bianca on the gravel roads. Probably they won't try and sweep lot of them sweeping, all off until they? they find some tarmac underneath. And a cleaning team also comes behind the race as well to clean up. Well, well they've got green zones fact. now, haven't green, they? And I've yeah, noticed that zones. more and more riders are being good about that and discarding their rubbish through that green zone. That's because they get nice fined if they're not good about it. Oh, I see. So and dot points, I think, now as well. Three questions left, the first of which comes in from Lance Oldstrong on Twitter. What are the best ways to recover from speed wobbles on a fast descent? A buddy recently had a very severe bout of speed wobble and narrowly averted disaster. He faithfully watches GCN. Have you got any tips? Well, first up, I would absolutely make sure that your buddy has had a good check over of his bike, that his tires are in good condition, everything's tight like it should be, nothing's loose. And then there's a few quick tips to solve this. Don't take your hands off the bars for a start and then try and avoid the speeds at which the wobble is occurring. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because yeah. some advice says to hold the bars a bit more stiffer and actually to put your knees in to hold the top tube to stop any flex there. Others say to relax a bit more and it should sort itself out. The causes of it in the first place, I think the jury is still out on as well. But actually, a couple of years ago, we did do a whole video dedicated to speed wobble and how you might be able to get yourself out of it. Nobody can be 100% sure as to exactly what causes speed wobble. However, there are a few theories out there at the moment. And the first of those is that your bike is not quite up to scratch. So maybe the two wheels aren't perfectly aligned. So at a certain point, they effectively begin to fight against each other. A little bit like you get in a car with badly aligned wheels, where the steering wheel starts to shake at a certain speed. If we're red in the face, it's because we're on our fourth take on this question, but hopefully this will be the one. Uh, the question comes in from Judd. And for the fourth time, I'm not going to try and pronounce your surname, but the question is this. Every good cyclist recently seems to have a background in both road and mountain biking. Uh, can you go into more detail as to why the two types of cycling are beneficial? And can you suggest a training week or month that optimizes time on both bikes? Well, the real answer is that these riders, these successful riders would have been just phenomenal at any discipline within the world of cycling. Yeah, talent. Te talent, exactly. Technically, they are a level above, and that probably does come from their background. They're, they're just simply more comfortable in a wider variety of scenarios. But the fact that they've competed in different disciplines also creates a more complete and well-rounded athlete. It does, and they've got better bike handling, which can make a big difference yeah. too, can't it? Which comes, as you said, from the fact that they're used to handling their bike in slippery conditions off-road, uh, which translates onto the road into saving energy, surfing the wheels. Same, in fact, goes for a lot of people with track back ground. Yeah. Uh, if you're used to flying around on the track at 60 k per hour in close proximity to other riders without any brakes, you're going to be pretty comfortable doing the same thing in a peloton when you have got brakes. So I think it does transfer over from that point of view. Uh, there's also the fact that cyclocross and track riders in particular are doing a lot of intensive training and racing over the winter months, so year round. And if you've watched this week's GCN show, you will know that we think that is possibly the secret of success on the road, year-round intensity. Um, there's another thing to add though, and that's to answer the question of how to integrate the two disciplines. I would aim for no more than one to two mountain bike or you know al alternative sessions a week because uh, cycling on the road is an endurance sport powered by your aerobic fitness. And mountain biking isn't an aerobic sport, essentially. So focus on the skills once or twice a week and then the, the anaerobic efforts that you get within the world of mountain biking. They're much shorter, much more intense efforts traditionally speaking. Yeah, they? good advice, I reckon. Uh, the last question comes in from Warsaw Piper. Uh, I've been training way more the last three months. I've lost a lot of weight and I've become stronger. I don't know my FTP and I don't use a speedometer. I'm just listening to my body. I use Strava on my phone and check the stats afterwards. Uh, I'll be gone for four weeks though and I won't have any road bike with me besides a simple city bike. So what can I do to stay in shape? Can I still train using a city bike? Suggestions? Uh, well, you can absolutely maintain your fitness on any bike, basically. If you're out on a city bike and you go up a hill as fast as you can and you're out of breath at the top, you're going to be putting your body under strain and maintaining a lot of the fitness that you've got already. Uh, but there are also some other options that you can do. There are, and also it is easier to maintain fitness than it is to try and build fitness. What's true. Um, 
aside from what Dan's just suggested, when you're away from your bike, you can also be consciously more active. So walk instead of taking a taxi or a bus or however else you like to get around. Take the stairs instead of an elevator, and then also trying four at a time, according to you. Four, yeah, I was going to say I sent Dan earlier. Launched himself up staircases, four steps at a time. Yeah, well, I think it's better for muscle activation to really like you know just. You know, I don't. I think I can only get up two at a time, maybe three. I'm going to we'll have a look later. <laughs> yeah. I reckon I could do five on a good day, Dan. Yeah. We'll have a look later. Any other advice off the um, bike? Yeah, other advice off the bike is then to also consciously think about the stabilizing muscles in your lower back, your stomach, and your hips, because they're traditionally quite weak areas within the world of cyclists. So um, try and include maybe two sessions a week where you focus on things like that. And between those three suggestions, you should find that you don't actually lose too much fitness and you'll come back fresh and motivated as well. Yeah, you could use the time to balance yourself up from that bad cycling posture you get. You know, yeah. Suffer fest that I did for 10 weeks, I was doing quite a lot of yoga. You which grew. I've now stopped doing, hence I'm back down like this. I have did you, grow almost an inch. Have you shrunk since? I've not measured myself, not measured myself, not doing much bike riding or much yoga at the moment. I must get back into it. But you have been running. A little bit, a little bit. I must get into that as well. All uh, right. Well, that kind of brings Ask You Anything to a close for the foreseeable future, as I mentioned at the start of the show. But don't forget to keep posting your training related questions to social media using the hashtag AskGCNTraining. And if you haven't yet seen this week's GCN show where we discuss the secret for success on the road as we see it, you can find that down here.